The NSM or neurosecretory motor neurons are two serotonergic neurons in the head region of C. elegans and they are generated during embryogenesis. The sisters of the NSM neurons are called NSM sister cells and they are eliminated again by apoptosis shortly after they are generated. The two NSM sister cells are basically two of the 131 cells that normally die during C. elegans development. I mentioned earlier that undead cells, cells that should have died but failed to do so, often adopt the fates of their sisters. That's also the case for the NSM sister cells. In Z3 or Z4 mutant animals in which apoptosis is blocked in general, the NSM sister cells inappropriately survive and take on the fate of their sisters, the serotonergic fate. The undead NSM sister cells even produce serotonin. The NSMs are the only neurons in the head region that produce serotonin. For this reason, in wild type animals, only the two NSMs are detected when one stains for serotonin containing cells, which can be done using an antibody specific to serotonin or a reporter construct. However, in Z3 mutant animals, for example, four serotonin containing cells can be detected, the two NSMs and the two undead NSM sister cells. This was used as an assay by Bob Horwitz and co-workers in the late 1980s, early 1990s, to screen for more C. elegans mutants with a defect in the invariant pattern of cell death. However, the goal of the screen was not only to identify mutations that cause a general block in apoptosis, such as loss of function mutations of Z3 and Z4, but to identify mutations that block specific cell death events and specific cell death events only, such as the death of the two NSM sister cells. Wild type hermaphrodites were mutagenized and their F2 progeny screened for mutants in which more than two serotonin containing neurons were present in the head region. Three mutations were identified this way, N703, N732, and N1950. Interestingly, two of the mutations turned out to be dominant, N703 and N1950. N732 turned out to be a recessive mutation and therefore most likely a loss of function mutation. Do the three mutations cause a general block in apoptosis? One convenient assay for this is the pharynx assay. The pharynx is the feeding organ of C. elegans and is, it is located in the head region. During the development of the anterior part of the pharynx, the anterior pharynx, a total of 16 cells are eliminated by apoptosis. In Z3 or Z4 mutant animals, many of these 16 cells inappropriately survive. By the way, two of these 16 cells are the NSM sister cells. These 16 undead or extra cells can be seen and counted by DIC microscopy because the positions of the cells and nuclei in the anterior pharynx don't vary much between animals. In Z3 mutants, for example, 12 extra cells can be counted in the anterior pharynx. This pharynx assay is still used by the C. elegans community to detect and also quantify a general defect in apoptosis. Analyzing the anterior pharynx in these new mutants revealed that the N1950 mutation causes a general block in apoptosis. In contrast, the N703 and N732 mutations specifically block the death of the two NSM sister cells. They do not block the death of most of the other 129 cells that normally die. N703 and N732 we are therefore called cell death specification mutations and the genes they define CES1 
and cis2. What these two genes are involved in is the very first step in the apoptotic process, the specification stage, the stage during which it is decided which cells live and which cells die. We might get back to these two genes in a later section. Going back to N1950, like loss of function mutations of Z3 and Z4, N1950 causes a general block in apoptosis. However, remember N1950 is a dominant mutation. It is therefore most likely not a new allele of Z3 and Z4. What is the normal function of the gene defined by N1950, which was named Z9? Can we find out about its normal function using N1950? Recessive mutations most often reduce normal gene function. However, dominant mutations can affect genes in different ways. In the simplest case, dominant mutations could increase normal gene function. They could cause an increase in gene expression or an increase in the stability of the gene product, or they could cause the gene product to be constitutively active. In that case, one refers to the mutation as a gain of function or hypermorphic mutation. One can test whether a mutation is a gain of function mutation by taking wild type animals and introducing into them, by transgenesis, multiple copies of the normal wild type gene of interest, the gene that is affected by the dominant mutation in the mutant. If animals with multiple copies of their gene exhibit the same phenotype that animals carrying the dominant mutation exhibit, the dominant mutation most likely is such a gain of function or hypermorphic mutation. The dominant mutation could also be a dominant negative or antimorphic mutation. In the case of dominant negative mutations, the mutant gene product generated from the mutant allele inhibits the wild type gene product generated from the wild type allele. And it therefore induces a phenotype that may reflect the loss of function phenotype of the affected gene. One can test whether a mutation is a dominant negative mutation by introducing into animals carrying the dominant mutation multiple copies of the wild type gene. If mutant animals with multiple copies of the wild type gene no longer exhibit the mutant phenotype, the dominant mutation most likely is a dominant negative or antimorphic mutation. Dominant mutations could also affect a gene in ways that confer functions to the gene that have nothing to do with its normal function. Such mutations are then referred to as neomorphic mutations. For example, such mutations could cause the gene to be expressed where it is normally not expressed, or it could cause the gene product to bind to proteins or molecules that it normally does not bind to. In this case, introducing multiple copies of the wild-type gene into wild-type animals would not cause the mutant phenotype. And introducing multiple copies of the wild-type gene into the mutant animals would not suppress the mutant phenotype. As you will see later, there can be somewhat of an overlap between gain-of-function mutations and neomorphic mutations. And sometimes it is hard to figure out which category is the more appropriate. For example, for both gain of function as well as neomorphic mutations, introducing the gene with the dominant mutation into wild type animals often confers on the wild type animals the mutant phenotype. However, it is really important to know what kind of mutation you have in your hands since it will affect the conclusion you make about the normal function of the gene. I should also mention at this point that the definitions for hypermorphic, antimorphic, neomorphic, etc. mutations are somewhat ambiguous and that some investigators might define them differently. 
The definitions I've given you are based on the definitions from Hermann Müller, a Drosophila geneticist who coined the terms and who received the Nobel Prize for his work in 1946. Finally, quite a number of genes show something referred to as dosage effect. What this means is that their activities are very sensitive to dosage and that one copy of them is not sufficient to fulfill their normal function. If a mutation behaves in a dominant manner because the gene is haploinsufficient, then the mutant phenotype reflects the loss of function phenotype of the gene. How can you test whether a gene is haploinsufficient? For some regions of the C. elegans genome, for example, strains are available in which one copy of a particular region has been deleted. If a strain that carries only one copy of the genomic region where the gene of interest is located exhibits the mutant phenotype, then the gene most likely is haploinsufficient and the dominant mutation represents a loss of function mutation. Unfortunately, for many of these tests, you need the wild type gene in hand or you need to know at least where the gene is located in the genome. And that was not the case in 1992 when the N1950 mutation was discovered. What else can you do to determine the nature of the dominant phenotype? You can simply try to find loss of function mutations. And that's what Michael Hengartner in Bob Horwitz's lab did. How do you find loss of function mutations when you have a dominant mutation in hand? You perform something called a reversion screen. And the idea behind such a screen is actually very simple. Dominant mutations can cause a phenotype for a number of reasons, as I just discussed in the last few minutes. However, gain of function, dominant negative and neomorphic mutations have one thing in common. If you inactivate the allele that carries the dominant mutation in heterozygous animals by introducing a second, a loss of function mutation, then the phenotype caused by the dominant mutation should be suppressed. And this is the principle of the reversion screen. To do a reversion screen on in 1950, Hengartner and Horwitz again took advantage of the egg-laying defective or egg phenotype of egg one animals. Remember, the egg phenotype of these mutants can be used as a readout for apoptosis. If apoptosis is working, the animals are egg -like. If apoptosis is defective, the animals are non eagle and can lay eggs. Michael Hengartner mutagenized males homozygous for N1950 and mated them with hermaphrodites homozygous for the eagle 1 mutation N487. The F1 cross progeny is therefore heterozygous for both loci N1950 over plus and N487 over plus. N487 confers an egg phenotype in a dominant manner. N487 over plus hermaphrodites are therefore egg. However, since the F1 animals are also heterozygous for N1950, which confers in a dominant manner a general defect in apoptosis, the animals have HSNs and therefore are able to lay eggs. N1950 basically suppresses N487. Now imagine what happens if the EMS mutagenesis hits the Z9 gene carrying the N1950 allele in males and if that second mutation is a loss of function mutation. In F1 animals, this new Z9 allele no longer would be able to suppress the ego phenotype caused by N487 because the new Z9 allele no longer causes a dominant Z9 phenotype. Therefore, such a F1 hermaphrodite should be eagle. And this is what Michael Hengartner screened for. In the F1 generation, he screened for rare egg-laying defective hermaphrodites using a stereo microscope. He screened a total of 9,000 F1s and identified three mutations, NDIF40, N2077, and N2161. NDIF40 turns out to be a deletion or deficiency 
of a particular region on chromosome 4. And it is the region on chromosome 4 to which the Z9 gene had already been localized to genetically. This deficiency is a large scale mutation that deletes a number of genes, including the Z9 gene. For this reason, NDIF40 came out of the reversion screen. It is basically a Z9 norm mutation. And 2077 and N2161 turned out to be recessive loss of function mutations of the Z9 gene. What is their phenotype? Both mutations were isolated in a heterozygous state, which means in the F1 generation over a wild type or plus allele. In the F2 generation, 25% of the progeny should be homozygous for the mutations. How did these homozygous mutants look like? These mutants grew up and they looked quite normal initially, but then they started to be, become unc uncoordinated and they failed to lay viable progeny. They generated very few progeny and the few progeny they generated failed to develop and hatch. What's wrong with these progeny? The embryos were analyzed using DIC microscopy and what was found is that there was massive apoptosis. Z9 loss of function mutations cause many cells that normally live to instead die. And this causes an arrest in development and embryonic lethality. The loss of function phenotype of Z9 is therefore ectopic apoptosis. From this, it was concluded that the normal function of the Z9 gene is to prevent apoptosis. Furthermore, the dominant Z9 mutation N1950 therefore represents a gain of function mutation. It causes an increase in the normal Z9 function and it causes a phenotype that is opposite of the phenotype caused by the Z9 loss of function mutations. Like the Z3 and Z4 gene, the Z9 gene therefore affects the central stage of the apoptotic process, the commitment of cells to the apoptotic fate. Thank you.